Welcome to Books of Titans. I'm Jason Staples, together with Eric Rostad, and this podcast is dedicated to the influences of influencers, the books that have helped shape prominent inventors, business leaders, athletes, intellectual scientists, and others. And we'll talk about what makes these books so important and influential, and at least attempt to have an intelligent discussion about these important works. Today, we're going to cover the book, Start With Why by Simon Sinek a book focused on rearranging the order in which you discuss your purpose and that of your company. As far as who recommended the book, on uh, page 373 of the hard copy of the monument that is Tools of Titans, Tim Ferriss says that uh, roughly half a dozen people in the book had suggested Start With Why by Cynic, including Peter Diamandis, who suggested Stone Soup, where... uh, (laughs) Yeah, I I mean, he lost my respect by suggesting that book and saying it was a a MBA course in that book. So (laughs) it it was still bitter about this. I was still bitter. Yeah. So I was hoping uh, this book would make make up for that. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, uh, Peter Diamandis, again, uh, also co-founded Planetary Resources Company, designing spacecraft to prospect near Earth asteroids for precious materials. And Robert Rodriguez, a director, screenwriter, producer, cinematographer, editor, musician, uh, and friend of uh, another great uh, director and cinematographer uh, who some may recognize out there. Who am I speaking of, Eric? Uh, William William Wallace. (laughs) Mel Gibson. I have no idea. I don't even know who Robert Rodriguez is. Oh, wow. Okay, so yeah... um, that is, uh, that's not it. Um, <laughs> the person I'm, of course, <laughs> thinking of is Quentin Tarantino, uh, who often uh, cameos in uh, Robert Rodriguez films, and it often goes uh, v- goes both ways there. So, cool. uh, so yeah, uh, Rodriguez is one of the uh, one of the recommenders of this. Uh, again, his films include things like Desperado, Sin City, Spy Kids. Did you seriously put Spy Kids on here as as one of his? His films. I wanted to balance it out with Sin City, show that he could do uh, both sides of the coin, I guess. Yeah, well, I mean, what he's probably probably should be best known for uh, isn't any of those. It's uh, Once Upon a Time in Mexico, uh, that, that series uh, that actually began with uh, El Mariachi. It's the El Mariachi Trilogy. Uh, that ends with Once Upon a Time in Mexico. But in El Mariachi, you gotta got to think about th- what's amazing to me about Robert Rodriguez uh, is he managed to to do El Mariachi in 1992 as a, an independent film. It was his first major, major feature. And he did that movie for, I think it was under $10,000. Wow. Like he shot everything. Uh, it was, uh, um, yeah, yeah. The, the estimated budget was $7,000. I just looked it up and they grossed over 2 million on that. And then, uh, you know, he had, he had a bunch of volunteers, uh, as actors and so on, uh, managed to, you know, pull off all sorts of shots, uh, by shooting them as cheaply as possible. And then the, the next, uh, the next in the series is, uh, Desperado, which is one of the ones that you mentioned, which at that point switched the lead actor to Antonio Banderas, which, uh, is, um, a little bit of a step up from a volunteer cast, and uh, by by uh, by uh, the time we see Desperado, we see Antonio Banderas and Salma Hayek in that and the final of the trilogy, which tells you how uh, how successful that first uh, seven thousand dollar project was. So, yeah. Um, anyway, this is not about that. <laughs> this podcast is about start with why. Also, one of uh, Tony Robbins' favorite books. Uh, regardless of what you think of Tony Robbins, it does kind of make a little bit of sense. But uh, I'll go ahead and let you take the uh, about the author there. All right. Simon Sinek, <laughs> at Simon Sinek on Twitter. That's Simon and then Sinek, uh, S-I-N-E-K. You can also find a lot of information uh, specifically about this book at uh, startwithwhy.com. Simon is a British-American author and marketing consultant. He started his career at New York agencies Euro RSCG and Ogilvy and Mather. And then he later launched his own business of Cynic Partners. Uh, he's got a TED Talk out there. It's the third most viewed TED Talk. T- of, of TEDx. 
TED, oh, uh, TEDx, TEDx yeah, yeah, yeah. third most, it's the third most viewed TEDx talk, right? Yeah, but I'll pull it up. I think it, last I looked, it was like 36 million. Yeah, or no, 30, 33 million views. Uh, and not bad. I watched it. <laughs> the mic crapped out on him in the middle of it. And he had to, uh, they brought him up a, a wired mic, uh, but he got through it. That's so 20th and century. Still, I know. Still, uh, still uh, one of the, I, I saw this morning that it was the top three uh, of the TEDx talks. And then uh, it's a, a good time to do this podcast because he just put out a companion book to start with why called find your why. And it's him and two other guys that work on the start with why company who uh, have put together a, a workbook of sorts that you can go through and, and help it help you to discover your why uh, they've got a chapter in there for individuals to find their why, but then also uh, for, for organizations. So it came out Tuesday. I got it and um, I'm going to go through it. So maybe I can, discuss that quickly in another another podcast episode but yeah, um, yeah. that is now so available <laughs> that's when you know you've made the big time as an author is when you're starting to release the workbooks and you start getting that whole like uh universe of resources to surround the book that you have that you know having the book isn't enough you've got to have the next thing i'm sure is going to be you know find your why for children and adolescents and coloring then, book yeah the coloring book and all that yeah yeah fine it's instead of where's waldo it'll be where's your why yeah, find your why punching bags. and <laughs> That's when you know you've made it. <laughs> so, so that said, let's go ahead and get to the big picture here. Uh, Eric, you, uh, you, you seem to like this book a lot. Yeah, I think uh, we'll have a good conversation here because I think I, I liked it a little more than you. Um, <laughs> I, th- I thought this is one of my uh, one of the best business books I've read, uh, perhaps of all time. I'm going to go ahead and go ahead and put that. And I've got that in this in my list of top five favorites so far of, of the ones that, that I've read for the books of Titans project. So I, I really enjoyed it and, uh, was pleasantly surprised. I, it took me a while to get into it. Um, but I've already used what I've learned in this book. I've used it in meetings and have recommended this book the most out of the books of Titans books so far. Um, and then even have bought it for a few people. So, I enjoyed it. Look forward to talking about it more. But uh, before we do that, uh, you you had a few uh, not so friendly things about the book, right? Yeah. So I, I wasn't really a fan of this book. So I mean, this is uh, you know normally we we're, we're pretty close on in terms of how we think about what we're reading, and you know there have been a few though that I've liked a lot more than you have, or vice versa. And this is one where you really liked it, and I just wasn't much of a fan of it. Mm-hmm. Um, I did think that there were a couple of good insights in the book. I mean, I, I think from a marketing perspective, the aspect of make sure your marketing and your mission are aligned, you know, your identity, have a, have a clear identity a, as a company or as an individual, and then make sure that your marketing aligns with that. Otherwise, your marketing is going to be ineffective because it's going to come off as as fake. Well, yeah, mm-hmm. yeah, that makes sense. I, I can I can go with that. Uh, and then, you know, the other, don't lose your purpose while you're pursuing what, you know, the the, the things that, that originally were pursuits for that purpose. Don't lose your purpose in the process. So again, it's about maintaining your identity, you you know, who you are and, and, and uh, the why, uh, you know, concept is, is a good one. That said, I was pretty turned off by a lot of the either outdated or just straight junk science in the book. Uh, and all sorts of just incorrect details and uh, sloppy uh, anecdotes that some of which are just weren't right. Uh, that 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 it, there was just, just too much of that for my taste. And the other thing is that I thought the book was at least fifty percent longer than it needed to be. I mean, yeah. it's one of those books that there there are actually sections like full sections that repeat. Like the stuff about Martin Luther King, like there's verbatim stuff that shows up early in the book. And then in a later chapter, it's verbatim, but just with a few tweaks. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, dude, you could have put that in there once. <laughs> like, I got it. I got it the first time. You didn't, you don't need to do it again. Yeah. And, 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 you know, I get impatient with some of those things. Like, don't waste my time. <laughs> yeah. Whereas, whereas like, you know, what we did with, with, with Drucker's effective executive, uh, it, that's a dense book. 
Like every line in that book basically has purpose. Yeah. Every line in that book, like you take a few lines out of that book and it's 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 weaker. It it's it it, effect, it negatively affects the book. I felt like you could have eliminated half of this book and it would have been at least as good and probably better. And 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 you know, as as someone with editing experience and all that, that that's probably some of that coming out as well. I'm I'm reading it going, man, if I were editing this book, I'd have I'd have had him take out half of this. Well, and I mean I can even see that in the the difference of, of the two books after I read them because I, I underline in the books and I mean start with wise got you know minimal underlining. I, I, I loved it, but when you compare that to the effective executive, I mean I almost <laughs> underlined that entire book to where it's not even really helpful to go back to it because the whole thing's <laughs> underlined. So Yeah, it's just read the whole book again. <laughs> but yeah, I, I um I, I agreed with some of those some of those, uh, the, especially the junk science, I, it, it just, he went into that. I, I didn't understand why, but, um, maybe that for some people it, it helps, but as you said, it, it it's, uh, it's junk science. So it's probably, I mean, I'm maybe, maybe being maybe a little bit harsh and calling it junk science because you do have some, there is some history of, of neuroscience taking sort of the approach or the, 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 the three level approach to the brain, but it's, it's pretty much discredited and, at this point and, you know, shouldn't really be, uh, shouldn't really be used but mm-hmm. anyway. Well, and, and, and for me, I, so the, the part we're discussing is, uh, the author relating why we can communicate about some things and not about others being the different parts of our brains that those ignite. Um, and, and, and it made sense for me because I just, I have a hard time sharing on <laughs> why on, on something. So I don't know if that's just, I, I poor at communicating or, uh, if there, if there was more truth to this, but that, that's one thing I, I really enjoyed about the book is, is, uh, it, it, I could different... relate to that of not, not being able to, to communicate a why behind something. Yeah. Well, and, but knowing, and... but knowing it, just not being able to, to say in words why yeah and that's something that i generally have not really experienced so yeah yeah <laughs> as, as a rule so that, that may be a big difference just in why we liked it or didn't like like the book too part part of that yeah but yeah. uh so at the beginning of the book it, it actually took me a while to get into it i was skeptical at the beginning i mean i listened to a lot of podcasts where uh their their business or marketing podcasts and uh and and the person will give the example of Apple. So it's like you you can make Everybody a statement and then Apple. and then just say Apple, and oh yeah, well you know th- this company was successful because of this. And then if you point to Apple, well it's like I, you can't go wrong with that kind of a a, a a way of communicating about your idea because Apple's successful all the way through. You know especially the, these later years. So it's it, start with why Simon Sinek uses Apple at the beginning all the time. And I'm like, I was just thinking, Oh, this is going to be another one of those books that he puts for some crazy idea and then uses Apple to, uh, to, to say that that's, that's why he's correct. But, um, it actually, he, he introduced some things to me about Apple that we'll get into later that I didn't even know or hadn't considered in that way. And so even though he was using Apple, I, I was, I was intrigued and, and, uh, interested in the, in the insightful details that he pulled out about Apple. Um, and yeah, from there, I think we can go into our, our favorite, our favorite quotes. Yeah. Why don't you take the first one? Okay. So the book has three main parts of, uh, of what a company does. And so the first is what the actual, I, I sell widgets. The second is how, so how do you sell the widgets? Uh, and then the third is why do you sell the widgets? So most people, he says, know the what they do. And if you ask anybody that that if you, if you go to a party or anything, that's kind of the first question you always get is, Oh, what do you, what do you do? And then the second, how do you do it? People can, can, uh, can discuss that as well. But the third thing is where a lot of people have trouble. Well, why are you doing this? Or, you know, why are you in business or why are you selling this or why, why do you do what you do? And so the quote is, "People don't buy what you do; they buy why you do it." And it's a it's a interesting concept, and, and that's throughout the book. But basically, everyone communicates what they do, but that's not why people buy it; they buy because of why you do it. And 
so that that's uh, that's my first quote, and I just thought it, it kind of summed up uh, the main talking points of a lot of the a lot of the book. Yeah, and it's true in some cases, at least. I mean, I, I, I the the thing is one of the things that I found interesting about this is from if you're if you're looking at things from a marketing perspective and you're trying to differentiate your product from somebody else, then that's a good approach. That said, for lots of things, especially things that have become commodified, people buy what you do. <laughs> they don't buy why you do it. I don't, I don't care why uh, my internet provider, internet service provider does what they do. I, I, I don't care. I don't care if it's DirecTV, AT&T, Google, whatever. I don't care. Just give me the best dang ISP I can have, and I'm buying the what, period. So that's not always true, even though I like the concept of, you know, you need to be integrated with that. If you want to do the best business possible, you, you have to have that integration. There are certain cases in which I, I, I again, I found that there are exceptions, dang it. Um, <laughs> I, I'll go with one, one of my favorite quotes here. Um, Some in management positions operate as if they are in a tree of monkeys. They make sure that everyone at the top of the tree looking down sees only smiles, but all too often those at the bottom looking up see only asses. <laughs> yeah, I think we've all been in those uh, those companies or those uh, environments. So uh, so yeah, that that one I I think uh, I can I can vouch for th- for that comment a hundred percent. It's a good one. Uh, I'm gonna <laughs> hit back to my uh, undergraduate days and my my next quote here. The quote is, it's a subtle irony that one of the best customer service companies in the country focused on on its employees before its customers. And this was in a quote related to Southwest Airlines, where their CEO made a a statement that his first priority was his employees and not his shareholders. And then brought me back to my... Yeah, before it's customers, but, but, and then, so th- this quote was directly with customers, but, but other places, uh, this CEO also said the, his employees come before his shareholders as well, which in my undergraduate days would have been blasphemous <laughs> and probably would have gotten you, you know, in trouble with the, the program. But it always, I, I, I always remember sitting in class and, and, and it's like, what's the purpose of a company? to, to make money for the shareholders, to make money for the share. I mean, that, that was the, the back and forth that always happened. And it was always about the shareholders. And that always struck me as just super odd. And I, it did, it never seemed right to me. And so I liked that, that he went into this whole part about, uh, Southwest airlines of putting their focus first on their employees. And his, his whole point is if we focus first on them, the employees, they're going to treat the customer. Well, the customer's going to come back. It'll all, it'll ultimately, impact the shareholders, the shareholders will make money. But if you, if your focus first is on the shareholder, that that's your priorities are way out of whack. And I, I, I loved that. And then it was just kind of one of the, uh, we've mentioned in other podcasts where, uh, so many of the like truths that I was presented with in, in <laughs> undergrad are just, I, I, they seemed odd at the time. And then now, like, I, I guess kind of broadening that it just, I, I don't know why they taught that. And I, I don't know Business if they still school, do man. or what. But, oh, they do. Yeah. They do. And this is one of the reasons why I, I still say that uh, among my very worst students, my weakest students, the ones that think the poorest in general, it's business students. Mm-hmm. I, I have a hard time a lot of times with business school students because they're not used to actually having to think beyond some of those, you know, well, we're going to do this for the shareholders. Well, you know, no, let's actually think, let's think about bigger problems. Let's think about bigger things. And that, that is one of the things that this book does bring to the table is it brings kind of a uh, humanities perspective to the business world, which is, I think, often very needed. Mm-hmm. So, you know, start with people, start with a why. There's, there's got to be something else other than just making money, which we'll get to uh, as one of my favorite quote, my, my favorite quote of the book, I'm, I'm saving for the end because there was one quote, if I had to choose one, that I would choose one over any other in this book, but I'm going to save that for the end. Oh, the anticipation's killing me. Oh yeah, I know, I know. <laughs> um, so yeah, I'm going to go with another one here. Uh, it's a twofold quote. Charisma has nothing to do with energy. It comes from a clarity of why. It comes from an absolute conviction, or it comes from absolute conviction in an ideal bigger than oneself. 
and you know this this is as he's explaining why certain leaders are able to lead and others you know other people who are in leadership positions just don't have that magic and mm-hmm. this is something that you know in the in social sciences and in humanities and so on there's been a lot of discussion over the years about what charisma is and you know uh, we'll, we'll, i guess later in the podcast I'll, I'll probably bring some of this in but uh you know most famously in the social sciences and in, in sociology max weber talking a lot about charisma and the charisma of, you know, these charismatic leaders who start something new and then eventually, you know, things get routinized into organizations and then, you know, the charisma is lost and the organization uh, begins to uh, to fold into, you know, becomes more or less something else. It gets it becomes routinized, you know, routine uh, mm-hmm. takes over and the organization stabilizes and then eventually you need someone who has charisma from the outside, who's eventually going to challenge that newly routinized organization. And that's very uh, bare bones, very, uh, you know, uh, you know, it's broad strokes there, uh, painting, uh, painting that picture of Weber, but that that's the basic idea. But I think uh, Sinek is basically right here, that, that the, the real magic of charisma is it's someone who has such an absolute conviction in an ideal bigger than him or herself that other people catch the vision and catch the magic. Uh, and that's really what charisma is. It's not, it's not this, and, and it's, you know, this is, uh, in, in a lot of sociological literature and in a lot of, uh, uh, humanities and social science work, charisma is treated as this, like, you can't really identify what it is. You can't put, you know, put, uh, a, 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 can't put something solid to it, but I think you can, I think he's right that, Charisma is what originates from, or what, what results from that original absolute conviction in an ideal b- bigger w- than oneself. And then he develops that a little bit later in the book with the second stage of, of what I'm treating as one quote. All leaders must have two things. They must have a vision of the world that does not exist, and they must have the ability to communicate it. I think that's very well said, very pithy. And it explains more or less what it is to be a leader that is someone who people are actually going to follow. What an effective leadership starts with those two things. You have to have a vision. And you have to have a vision not just of things as they are, but things that will be better than they than they are. Something that you want to lead, that people will want to pursue. And you have to have the ability to communicate that and sell that to people. That's charisma, and that's what mm-hmm. leadership is. I, I, I did like those those portions of the book quite a bit. Yeah. That's cool. My my uh, my third one is with a why clearly stated in an organization, anyone within the organization can make a decision as clearly and as accurately as the founder. And this came in a section. I, I think it was the same section with Southwest Airlines, where they're talking with a clear why. So Southwest Airlines, they're to be the the low cost airline, the the airline for for the middle class, uh, so so that other people could fly. Not just uh, not just the wealthy, and so they they talk about this idea of, well, what if uh, what if somebody comes in, with a, a vendor comes into Southwest Airlines and, hey, we could we could add these amazing meals to your to your flights and but it would raise the cost of the ticket ten or fifteen dollars, that would go against their their clearly stated why of 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 what the organization is about. And so the idea there is that anyone in the organization, the janitor, anyone would, would know if you brought a question to them, uh, should we do this or should we do such and such within the company? Anyone within the company should be able to say yes or no based on that clearly defined why I thought that that was excellent. And that that's really where this, this comes into play in terms of business and and even marketing, Uh, marketing to, to tell, outside consumer to tell the world about your, your company and your product, but also inside, like just so everyone knows what the company is about. And it, it just got my wheel spinning on how that could really help within a, an organization. If that is clearly defined and, and everyone knows where they're going, what they're doing and why they're doing it. Yeah. Again. And I think that, that is one of the strengths of this book. I just wish it had been more focused on, yeah. on, on that in, in, in some ways. Um, all right, another one. Uh, so this would be my fourth, or sort of 4.5, I guess, since I mixed two. It, it, uh, it is the partnership of a vision of the future and the talent to get it done that makes an organization great. And he talks, you know, at some length 
about how, you know, a lot of visionaries wind up as, you know, starving, uh, uh, as, you know, starving, starving visionaries, they have all sorts of answers and could really make contributions, but they never find an operational partner to help them actually make an organization that can accomplish their vision. So unfortunately, lots of visionaries wind up never connecting, never actually having the impact that they could have if they just found someone who was, who was, a, who was better on the, uh, uh, on the operations front. And, and he talks about the importance, you know, that some people are more natural, do more naturally live in the why zone, and they can they can better articulate that. And then you have the need for the how people to get it done, and the what mm-hmm. people to get it done. And you know the why needs to stay cent- stay central, but without the how people, without the operations people, without the Tim Cooks, if you're going to follow the uh, uh, the the Apple example, without Tim Cook to be one of the best operations people in the world, Apple doesn't become what it did in Steve Jobs' second go-round, right? Because he's able to really trim margins and keep things to where the company could stay competitive and achieve Jobs' vision. So, mm. you know, that, that and, and he doesn't actually use that example, but, you know, that's one that, uh, that, that fits one of those pieces uh, that, that, that fits this quote. Nice. My fourth one is when people can point to a company and clearly articulate what the company believes and use words unrelated to price, quality, service, and features, that is proof the company has successfully navigated the split. When people describe describe the value they perceive with visceral, excited words like love, that is a sure sign that a clear sense of why exists. I remember talking about this in in another podcast episode where (laughs) I think it was 22 Laws where you hear people talk about, oh, I love that brand. I love that. Uh, but they've never even experienced the brand. Uh, I, th- I think this may hit on that in, in, a, in a way. Of the, pe- the companies that do have a clear sense of why they're doing things, you may be excited about the, the product, but it's, it's, it's more what it's telling about yourself and in, in in your identity. So you're able to identify with that company and you love it because you feel that their, your identity is connected with their identity and there's something you, you you use excited words like love instead of well I, I like this because they have a better price or they have a better uh, you know their their quality is is a lot better. So I thought that was a, a good 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 uh, description of of a lot of what he talks about in the book. Yeah, uh, and again, I, I I think he hits on why some of these companies again he uses you know Apple, Harley Davidson, and. Uh, Southwest primarily throughout the book as examples where, you know, people are viscerally connected with these brands in many cases, and and they're going to keep those brands going, even if the brand isn't necessarily the best at what it does at that time, at what it does, they, they believe in, in the why of the company. So they're going to keep, keep the company going. And that, that's a big, that's a big, uh, a big deal. Mm-hmm. Another thing I want in my next quote, success and achievement are not the same thing yet too often we mistake one for the other. In my vernacular, achievement comes when you pursue and attain what you want. Success comes when you are clear in pursuit of why you want it. And I think that's a good distinction. Now, I actually will add one more. I think, and I think this is one of the things that's lacking from the book in in lots of ways, is he's constantly talking about how you need to be in pursuit. You need to define your why. You need to define your why. You need to figure out what your why is. And then, you know, that'll, that if you can just, you know, have, you can be clear in pursuit of the why and uh, you're doing what you're doing, then, then, then you can have success. The problem that I have is some whys just suck. <laughs> what if your why, what if the why you come to is actually going to be unsatisfying? Are you going to be successful then? Can you have, can you be clear in pursuit of a why, but the why is actually not something that's actually good. And as a result, when you are pursuing that, when you do attain what you get and you do get that achievement, you still don't have success, even though the why is clear, even though the what is attained. (sighs) But I do like that distinction between achievement and success, which I think is very important, particularly for those who do, who do have success, who do have, who are achievers. And, you know, there's that that whole concept. I mean, there, there was a recent article on uh, Aaron Rodgers, the, the quarterback for the uh, Green Bay Packers, who after he won a Super Bowl, gets on the bus and has this thought of, I hope this isn't all I do. Hmm. 
I think that was a quote or something like that. Like, I hope, I hope this is not all I do. Like he, he gets to the very top, the mountaintop and he realizes like, yeah, this was nice, but I hope this isn't all I ever do. Like this isn't, this isn't what it is to be like, I hope this isn't what it is to be me. I remember Deion Sanders saying something very similar after, after he won the Super Bowl, And he said he, he, he was the first person to go to bed that night on his team. Like it, it was so unsatisfying compared to what he thought it would be that. Yeah. Is this that it? He just went to bed. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I think that phenomenon is really common. And, and the only way to really have success and contentment, see success comes with contentment. The only way to have that is to maintain a, not only a clear why, but I think you have to have a robust and good why. And that, that, that's, that's even harder to get to than, than what I think Cynic gets to in this book where he's talking about, about you have to find a why. Well, I, I would say you need to find a good why. And I think that part yeah. of the book is sometimes left out. But anyway. Yeah, no, that's a good, that's a fair point. Uh, my next one short one finding why is a process of discovery not invention and when he's talking about finding your why and discovering it's a, a discovery it's, it's it's looking back over your life to determine what it is it's not well i'm going to come up with a why statement and then hopefully everything fits into that <laughs> so it was a good distinction i guess in 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 the sense of if you're going to go through that process of trying to define your why uh it's look back don't necessarily look forward in, into what you want it to be, but, but look find back and yourself. In, yeah, find yourself. Discover. So yeah, and then uh, you've got you've got one other one. You that yeah. this one was short, so go with the last one. Yeah, and this one, this one's a funny one. I started having desperate this is uh, Simon Sinek talking. Uh, I started having desperate thoughts, thoughts for an, that for an entrepreneur are almost worse than suicide. I thought about getting a job. <laughs> So obviously he didn't, he started a company, he, uh, but he's, he went through his, his, uh, his life story and the epiphany he had of, of the, of this why, and he started sharing with, with his friends. And then they said, wow, this is really something. And then now he shares it with companies and people all over the world. And so he was talking about his, his story there, but he almost, almost had to go through that, uh, point, not of, not of suicide. It wasn't that bad. It was, it was actually, he might have to go get a job. Yeah, well, it might have been worse, he said, in suicide. Yeah. Yeah. So my favorite quote, and this is, I think, the money, the money quote for the book in lots of ways, is money is never a cause. It is always a result. Money is never a cause. It is always a result. And this is where what you were talking about earlier about when you're in business school, you're getting, well, you know, why does a business exist? Well, to make money for the shareholders. You know, what's the purpose? What, what, what's the objective of the business to make money for the shareholders? No, that can't ever actually be the case. And understanding this single principle is the antidote for that. And that is money is never a cause. It is always a result. Money is always a second thing, not a first thing. So if your, if your objective in business becomes making money, then you can be sure that eventually your business will fizzle out and fail. That, and, that, and he talks about it too in, in light of your why, because most, most people he talks to and just asks the question, what, what's the why behind what you do? A lot of people, their first thing they say is, well, I need to make money and I need to support my family and I need to pay my mortgage. I need to send my kids to school. It's, it's about money. That's why I do it. And he says, no, it's not about money. And, and hits that quote there. So, yeah, that, that is, is an excellent one. And I, I think help helped really distinguish because I, even me, like, I, why do you do what you do? Well, I, I mean, I, in, in a lot of ways I do it to make money. It's, it puts food on <laughs> yeah, the table, you, you know, to, you have to do something to make money, but, but the real but question is why the, do you do that? that? Can't be the, yeah. Yep. Right. So, and, and I think that, and this gets back to, again, one of my favorite pieces of writing is actually by C.S. Lewis, where he talks about the difference between first things and second things. Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, this is an Aristotelian notion. Uh, and, you know, he basically says right up front, you, you know, you can't, uh, you can't put second things first and have them first and, and, and keep them. So it, here's, here's a few of the quotes. 
He says, the woman who makes a dog the center of her life loses in the end not only her human usefulness and dignity, but even the proper pleasure of dog keeping. The man who makes alcohol his chief good loses not only his job, but also his palate and all power of enjoying the early or the earlier and only pleasurable levels of intoxication. It is a glorious thing to feel for a moment or two that the whole meaning of the universe is summed up in one woman. Glorious so long as other duties and pleasures keep tearing you away from her. But clear the decks and so arrange your life if it is sometimes, or it is sometimes feasible, he says, so that you will have nothing to do but contemplate her, and then what happens? Of course, this law has been discovered before, and again, as, as I mentioned, it's a, an Aristotelian notion. It will stand rediscover, but it will stand rediscovery. It may be stated as follows. Every preference of a small good to a great or a partial good to a total good involves the loss of the small or partial good for which the sacrifice is made. You can't get second things by putting them first. You get second things only by putting first things first. Put first things first, and this is in another, uh, another uh, this is in a letter that he wrote to someone else. It's not in this particular article, but he said, put first things first, and we get second things thrown in. Put second things first, and we lose both first and second things. We never get, say, even the sensual pleasure of food at its best when we are being greedy. So this this concept of you put money first money is a byproduct not a prime product money comes when you do something that's worthwhile money comes when you introduce a great product that meets a need that sometimes people didn't even realize they had mm -hmm. but you start doing stuff just to make the money and eventually you're going to run out of a way to make the money and, and that's where the start with why thing gets to it. But I actually think that, you know, that article on first and second things by Lewis more or less encapsulates everything in this book in like three pages. Yeah. <laughs> so that's part of why I, I, I perhaps I, I enjoyed this book less is I thought Lewis put it better and shorter and without as without a number of the problems that were in this book. So. Yeah. You know, but that doesn't negate the that this book has a lot of positive things to say. I do want to I do want to say that up front. It just, you know, the fact that it does say them is a good thing. I, I just think it could have in some some places said them better. Yeah, well, let's let's get into some of those. Uh, <laughs> yeah, let's those get things. into the nitty gritty. <laughs> so my one of my first things was uh, I, I enjoyed him talking about authenticity. He talks about your why never changing. So when my other quote of, of why being a process of discovery it's it, it's looking back to see common threads uh, that have combined in what you've done, whether that's business things, uh, different jobs. The the why should never change in that. And then, so your why never changes, but the what and the why connecting it, those those can change. The what you do, as long as it aligns with your why, those things can constantly change. And he, he has this quote of having excitement and trying to find new ways and different what's to bring why to life. I thought that was cool. His his why is to inspire everyone to take action, inspire leaders to take take action. So, uh, his book is is an example of that. His website, his 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 talks, uh, but but it goes beyond this book. It goes into into to a lot of different things. And, and he says it's a it's a exciting process of of finding out what else I can do that aligns with that why that clearly defined why. Uh, he had a quote that went from there with consistency. People will see and hear without a shadow of a doubt what you believe. After all, we live in a tangible world. The only way people will know what you believe is by the things you say and do. And if you're not consistent in the things you will say and do, no one will know what you believe. Yeah, and then what he builds on that. What authenticity means, and I like his definition of authenticity, is that your golden circle your why, your how, and your what are in balance. It means that everything you say and everything you do, you actually believe. That's a good place to be. Yeah. You know, belief or uh, faith or whatever you want to call it. Faith without works is dead is, you know, the old uh, uh, epistle of James way of saying it. You, mm -hmm. you have to have that that balance. But the, And the only way that I can know that you really believe what you believe or that you really 
have a why that is that is that why is by what you do. Mm -hmm. And, and that's for all that to be authentic. And and one of the other books we we read, I, I can't recall which one at the moment. Maybe maybe you'll remember just by me talking about it. But they talk about authenticity and, and how to how to be authentic and how that's that's really not the right way to approach it. And I, I think this this description here gets into a little more of that. Authenticity is just having a clearly stated why of, of why you do things and then all those things aligning the marketing, the inside the company. And they're not they're not being uh, something that div diverges from that. And, it, and it's very easy to see the things that diverge. And so if you're in a company and, and, and it's all about saving money, uh, you're in a, you're in one of those seasons where it's, you know, we gotta, we gotta tighten our belts and the, the leader of the company is, is still eating, you know, $300 meals and, and taking private jets everywhere. It, that doesn't align with, with the, the purpose at, at that time. And so it's, it's very easy to see when things are not consistent and, and that's authenticity. It's not it's not a manufactured authenticity. The, the authenticity starts with the why, and then it trickles down. It's not the other way around of, of trying to do things that, that meet your, your why. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, you know, you used obviously an example from one of our prior episodes from the, uh, from the Iacocca, uh, biography where he talks about, uh, Henry Ford Jr. Uh, doing exactly that. So, or was it the third? I can't remember. Um, second. It's, yeah, it's the second. That's right. Yeah. So junior, uh, <laughs> Henry, the Ford. Yeah. Henry, the Ford as you, <laughs> yeah. so, uh, anyway, uh, the next one that he talks about is this uh, notion of attraction, which I thought was an interesting one. Um, this, and he makes this point that, that, that why, that if you have a clearly defined why it actually attracts, it actually attracts people who are attuned to that frequency, to that why frequency, uh, and one of the examples he gives is that of immigrants, right? And how, how does that how does that relate? Yeah, the um, he he asked the question in this in this section: Are all immigrants hardworking and great citizens? I, you know, the United States has, has been blessed to have amazing immigrants who have who have built companies, buildings, uh, bu you know, built this country. Is it is are all immigrants like that? And he says. Or did or he asked the question? Or did America have a well-defined why that attracted the best people? And he, he says it's because we had a we had a why. You know, give me your tired, your poor, your huddled masses yearning to breathe free, the wretched refuse of your teeming shore. Send these, the homeless, tempest tossed to me. I lift my lamp beside the golden door. And then you you combine that with the American dream, and you you have a clearly defined why of why, why people would come. And if they're attracted to that, that's going to attract these hardworking and great immigrants. And it, it brings up a question that he doesn't address in the book, but, uh, but are we losing that with perhaps losing our, our why or as a country or losing our, our why? So well, that, and, that was a, and, yeah, that, go ahead. and that gets to the question of when you lose your why you fundamentally are losing your identity. Right. That split that happens between the what and the why is a split where you are no longer being true to your identity. You start becoming someone or something else. Right. You once were this. And now because you're no longer operating according to that core value, you're, you're becoming something else. And, that, yep. you know, he talks a lot about identity in this book as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, which gets to, to, to the next uh, one, one quote. When we are inspired, the decisions we make have more to do with who we are and less to do with the companies or the products we're buying. They didn't really care about Apple. It was all about them. And I, I, I that's confess the, I see that in my, my own life. The customers know? who buy Apple products care more about them and their identification with Apple than they do about Apple. Yeah, yeah. And, and I, I mean, I, I see that in myself. Uh, I, I saw another part where you had written that you didn't buy a Mac because Apple had a clearly defined why. And, and I, that's not why I did either. Um, but there was something about Mac and maybe it wasn't the <laughs> think different tagline, but there was something about it that, that made it stand apart. And, and I, I can't clearly define what that is, but now I'm to the point where it, if, if Apple makes it, I'll buy it. And <laughs> you know, it's probably not a good place to, to be, but 
uh, yeah, so he goes on, we're in pursuit of understanding the best practices of others to help guide us, but it is a flawed assumption that works for one organization, or, or it is a flawed assumption that what works for one organization will work for another. And in the book, he talks a lot about comparing Apple with, with other computers and, and how Apple companies, comp- yeah, companies, uh, but companies that are defined by computers, but with Apple by defining their why and it being much broader, they, they didn't define what they did. You know, we make computers, but they defined why they did it in this idea of think, think different or think differently. Yeah. Well, uh, again, they, they, they're, you know, grammar different, right? <laughs> Uh, but, but yeah, identity, uh, it, it, and then starting with, uh, so Apple started with the why. So with Dell computer, you can't imagine buying uh MP3 or a watch from Dell computer, but you could from Apple because it, it, it connected with their, their and, why. And see, I guess that's where I'm unusual because I could totally imagine buying a Dell, a Dell MP3 player or watch. If it was, if it was the best one there, that, that's what I would do. Yeah. <laughs> So well, yeah, then this the, is the, this is one of those places. Like you mentioned in, in the notes, I've got. Well, I didn't buy a Mac because I identified with the company, right? I mean, he. This is in response to his quote. He says, "If people made only rational decisions and did all the research before making a purchase, no one would ever buy a Mac." But of course, people do buy Macs, and some don't just buy them; they love them—a feeling that comes straight from the heart or the limbic brain. <laughs> and my response to that is, I didn't buy a Mac because I identified with the company or because of some irrational need. I bought a Mac because the best software for my particular field at that time was really only available for a Mac. So I bought a Mac. Mm-hmm. In fact, I'd been running that software on an emulator using uh, Windows machines. You know, I because I, I when I was in college, I built Windows machines for myself and for other people and so on. And, you know, I, I I've built a lot of computers over the years. Uh and, uh, and, and, you know, I would run this particular program, uh, for, uh, or application as they like to say in the, uh, Apple environment. Uh, I ran this app in a, uh, uh, in an emulator for two or three years before I ended up making a switch to, to Apple, uh, basically to be able to run this, this, this application in its native environment. So, yeah, I made that decision entirely because, was the best option for me and I'm more or less in the, in the walled garden right now, but you know, I could totally see myself in two or three years. If you know, the, the proper software that I need for my prod for my, for my stuff is better available in a windows environment, making the switch and doing something else. I mean, I, I've never had that attack. So I, I guess I, I don't see that. I don't, when I was reading through, it was like, well, I don't, I don't tend to do things that way. <laughs> <laughs> Even but, with Mac. yeah, and I, I and I, I think I do. And I for the for, <laughs> the first Mac I bought, I I think it was just a cool thing, and I just wanted. I, I'd been using Apple for different school projects, and it's like, well, this is different than than uh, than Windows. Let me let me give this a try. <laughs> and I I just fell in love with that computer. Is the time I started my business, so it was it was I was starting to do different, more design related things on the computer than than just straight Word and Excel stuff. So that kind of got into it, but then. I, in, in relation to this identity issue here, I, I started, there was something about the Mac where like, if, if I thought I could do something on the computer, if I, if I did it, whether it was just dragging thing from one place to another, if, if I did that on a windows, it, it wouldn't, a lot of times it wouldn't work, but if I did it on a Mac, it, it would work. And so <laughs> it was almost like I was, I, I may sound crazy to people, but it was like, I, the Mac made more sense to me. And one mistake I made with a, with a, a client of mine is a uh, older gentleman is he, he had been using windows his whole life. And I, I said, well, let's switch you to Mac. I think you'll really enjoy it. And he, he hated it. He's still using Mac, but he, 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 it's, it doesn't work for him. And, and I think part of it is, is that identity. Like you get used to using something, you get used to well, you also- how things would work. You think something will work one way and then, and then it does uh, you want to go back to what you're, you're comfortable with. Well, yeah, it's, it's a lot about familiarity, right? I mean, it's not, it, so mm-hmm. what's intuitive to you is what you've become accustomed to by, uh, by, by practice, right? You get habituated mm-hmm. to things because it's what you've been exposed to the most. Mm-hmm. And so then what we do is we have all sorts of heuristic shortcuts in our brain, in our mental process that, okay, well, when I do it this way, this is how it works. And then 
what happens is anytime you change the process for which you have to do something, that introduces new mental strain, new mental overhead, because you're now having to learn a new way to do something like right. You know, if you walk down the street, you don't actually have to think about putting foot one foot in front of the other, even though at one time it was really complicated. Mm -hmm. Right. But then you kind of figure it out and your, your body gets accustomed to it. You get habituated to it. And then it's natural. But if you had to learn a new way to work or a new way to walk every day, it'd be, it'd be really hard to get anything else done. So -hmm. yeah, if you're in a windows environment all the time, and then suddenly you switch over to a Mac environment, it's going to change it. You're going to have, it's going to make your head spin because certain things are done backwards from one to the other, or certain things are done. It's just done differently in certain things. Now, because I built computers on the windows side and I've done all sorts of stuff on the windows side and I've worked on the Apple side, it really doesn't matter to me, you know, I, mm-hmm. it, but it's not, I don't think in that case about identity so much as, well, this isn't intuitive to me. Well, why is it not intuitive? It's not because I'm an Apple kind of person and I'm, I'm someone who challenges authority. No, it's because I probably used windows computers for, you know, 10 years before this and having to relearn how to do this or that in a, in a Unix based environment where, you know, maybe you don't have the same kind of registry. You've got libraries, which are slightly different. You've got, you know, different kinds of things in there that, uh, that, that just aren't done exactly the same way. No, you don't have a start button anymore. Oh, well, what do I do? Right. So yeah, yeah, that stuff. And that, by the way, is one of the reasons that people hated the change to windows on certain things, you know, when Vista came out and when, uh, windows, windows eight and windows 10 came out and a lot of different interface stuff was changed. A lot of people hated it because again, they were used to the shortcuts that they could count on having in their, in their, in their, in their head already in their process already. And having to relearn that stuff is a pain. Mm -hmm. So that's again, something where, and I guess this is as good a time as any to really get into it some of the complaints that I had about this book is, you know, he really wants to push this idea of, you know, the triune brain theory that was really pushed um, in the 1960s. I mean, the, the hypothesis comes more from psychiatry than it does from neuroscience. And actually the idea of the triune brain of, you know, the limbic system and all of this, uh, you know, you have the limbic brain that, that, uh, uh, that you know it preserves basic reptilian paleo mammalian brain functions and then you know works works at that uh at that uh you know basic brain stem level and then you've got you know your primitive limbic system where you have reflexes and emotion and all that and then on top of that is the latest to develop the 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 brain the 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 the, uh, the forebrain the uh the uh, neocortex, where rational, critical thought is is done, and that's developed, and all that, and you know that that what's interesting about that is again, if you go through history, that idea of a triune or tripartite way that human beings process things and and function is at least as old as the pre-Socratics, going back into like this in the seventh century BCE Greece. Well, would that be you're talking about your brain, your heart, and your gut? Yeah, that's how they talk about it. Is 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 basically your your mind, your heart, and your belly or your genitals, your flesh, your gut. Mm-hmm. And they talk about it that way, where you have you know the part of you that that contemplates the eternal and the principles of things, and then the part of you that's your will, the 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 place where you know the seat of the emotions and the will, which is you know associated with the heart and the the chest, uh, and you know that that's 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 that section, and then you have the appetites, which are associated with the gut, the belly, the genitals, right? Well, what's interesting here is that his he uses in this book the term gut for really that central part not for the what would in the greek world be the uh, the or in older philosophy the 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 gut part which would be have to do with you know urges and and appetites that have to do with being embodied creatures but uh but basically you know freud repopularized this triune thing which i mean the christian tradition pulls a lot of that into uh into 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 itself from the uh 
the Stoics and the and and the and Middle Platonism and all that at the time that that Christianity was rising. So I mean, it becomes a common thing. You hear about you know the triune soul and all this. You know, human beings are triune creatures, as you know, typical uh, Western Christian language. But you know, that's common. But then what he does is he tries to layer this into neuroscience and says this is biologically. It's just biology. This is how it works. And that's eh. actually the the exact thing he says in his video. This the the why the why thing makes sense because biology, right? <laughs> and the problem is that, well, you know, McLean really pushed all this. You know, it, it was introduced uh, in the triune brain, brain theory was really introduced uh, uh, by McLean. And the problem is, McLean p- uh, proposes a layering where he says you have the lowest reptilian layer, and then you have you know the limbic system the amygdala and all that stuff. And then you have the, uh, the, the neocortex, but there are a couple problems with this is first of all, if you were going to layer things now, most modern models put things in four layers, right? You've got your basic brain stem, you've got your limbic system, your basal ganglia, and then your prefrontal frontal cortex, which is a whole different thing. But then the other problem is that the brain didn't evolve by adding layers. So as, as uh, you know, the brain has evolved over time, what's happened, is, and you see this in different species and all this, the whole circuits, the whole way the brain works together reorganizes and, re, uh, and evolves together so that various, uh, various regions become increasingly complex overall. So it's not like, oh, well, you know, we have the lizard brain here, and then upon that is built this. No. Actually, it's not that you have different parts of the brain that compete. It's that you have the whole brain working together at all sorts of things, at at all sorts of levels at at one time. And yeah, in like fight or flight system uh, circumstances and all that, you may have like adrenaline kick up and, and, you know, rational thought gets pushed to the back. But even then, you're still lighting up everywhere. Even then, the brain is, is, is dynamically working at a complex level in ways that really are not uh, the, the way that, you know, he puts this together in terms of, well, this is just biology. It, it, I'm sorry, it just isn't. It just isn't. And, you know, yes, there are distinctions between, you know, things that we, we kind of intuitively know or we know in our gut or whatever and what we might be able to reason out. But again, what the example that I just gave about someone going from, say, Windows to Apple, to an Apple environment, uh, to a Mac environment, is, is, is instructive. Because what he would say, what he might say in this book is, well, if you can't really put words to it, but it's that you know, deep gut thing, you have a visceral reaction, well, that's because it's the limbic system. That's because you're not, it's not, we're, we're not dealing with the biological level of the pre- prefrontal cortex. Uh, no. No, that's not, that's not true. The, the reality is that in many cases, the, that, that prefrontal cortex where we do a lot of our reasoning and, ration, ration, uh, and take care of a lot of our rationale and all that, that is, first of all, in, in, inextricably interconnected with that limbic system. And second of all, we're forgetting narrative, socialization, and habituation. So what happens is someone rationally learns how to do something. You learn this is why, this is how, and so on as a kid. But over time, those things become habit. Now, by in becoming habit, you don't suddenly switch and now it's a different part of the brain entirely. It's not like you take that memory and it's like moved, like by a forklift somewhere in the brain to somewhere else. No, what happens is certain neurons and, and different bridges and you know, different connections in the brain are always made and, and sorted and, and some are removed and different connections are constantly being sorted by the brain all the time. And stuff that is used constantly gets stronger and sometimes it gets rewired. And a lot of times that's, I mean, most of the time that's, that's also dealing with rewiring in the frontal cortex and that, in that neocortex. And, but what happens is it's becoming a stronger connection because you're, you, you've discovered that if I do it this way, it keeps working. So here's how I'm going to do it in the future. Here's how I'm going to do it in the future. And eventually it becomes habit. 
Mm-hmm. And then when you violate habit, you get uncomfortable because the strong connections that you've drawn, that you've learned work, something is unsettling about that. First of all, it's comp- it, it, it reintroduces complexity where, the, where you're not used to it anymore. And so, you know, this is where if we want to talk about biology, we want to talk about how all this works. A lot of this is not so much tapping into the limbic system. It's tapping into how people are socialized. It's tapping into what narratives have they embraced over the course of their life. And this is where actually, if you really want, you know, good stuff on this, Christian Smith's living narratives is really good on this material. Uh, A sociologist that used to be at UNC, now at uh, Notre Dame. Christian Smith has a, has, a, has a piece called Living Narratives. It's excellent on this, where he talks about human beings are storytelling creatures. And at the end of the day, when you decide not to shoplift, generally speaking, you're not rationally considering, well, if I shoplift, then here's the odds that I get caught and so on and so forth. No, by the point you get to making that decision, you've been socialized by various narratives that you've embraced to say, I'm not the kind of person who shoplifts. Because you could probably just walk out with it, you know, all the, you know, all sorts of times. But, you know, I'm just not the kind of person who does this. I'm an honest person. I've embraced this narrative of myself. Is that a limbic thing? No. Is it connected to the limbic system in some, in some aspect? Sure, everything is. But what it is, is you've embraced a narrative that has been introduced that is, that is ro- deeply rooted in who you are in your identity that has been, has become habituated. You've become socialized into that person. And now, even though at some point in the past, maybe there was some rationale behind it, you may not even remember it. That connection's strong, though. And it may be in your pre- 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 prefrontal cortex. It may be in that neocortex, or it may you know, be connected in all different ways. But all of that stuff works together. This is not biology. So that, that drove me crazy in this it, book. From a, from a company's point of view, then, they, w- they would want to market their identity so that the people that have that narrative would identify with their product. Correct. Right. And that's the thing is that's this is not just, I think that's actually more useful, right. As a, as yeah. a marketing thing, it's not, well, what you need to do is you need to find a way to tap into the primitive lizard brain of the people outside there and find a way to tap into their emotion. No, find how your narrative the narrative that that really help, that you that you can identify, and and again, Smith's uh, Living Narratives has a great chapter on this where he talks about how there's all sorts of competing narratives out there. One of which is this American dream, American exceptionalism narrative, where we are the land of the free and the home of the brave. One, at one time, people were you know basically in the old world and and they were oppressed and you know people didn't have an opportunity for upward movement and growth and all that, but and, and so they decided to leave and come to a place where we we have turned that on its head. And if you want want the land of opportunity that's us and we and and lar- by and large american identity has embraced that for for generations mm-hmm. and so the decisions that we make plug into that and if you want to mark if you want to be have a successful why if you want to market yourself well then first of all have a product that fits into that kind of american identity which apple does by the way that's the uh, you know we're we're the rebels we're 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 the you know Americans at you know at, at you know par excellence. Well, and, and he, as he mentions in the book, and I never even thought about this before. All their advertisement show individuals; they they never show people in a group. Yeah, using their product. And although that's changed a little bit in recent years, but 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 yeah, that's that that's generally how they've done things. It's all it's almost always individuals. Mm-hmm. Um, but. And you notice, by the way, Android is the opposite. It's almost always groups and how we're better together, that sort of thing. You know, that's mm-hmm. the uh, that's the new Microsoft in that sense. Google's trying to you know appeal to the group, but um, or Alph- Alphabet now, right? Um, but uh, but you know, th- this is where I think he w- his his stuff would be much stronger if he took the sociological approach here instead of trying to to put this onto BS uh, biology where you know biology is destiny that idea which is not not really true and actually accom- accounted for narrative uh and narrative sociology and how that works i mean a little bit of christian smith Al- a-, a little bit of alistair mcintyre you know th- th- some some of these uh, some of these people who really focus on how people come to these identities which are story based 
that's where I think he could he could take this a step further than just find your why and plug into the you know biology of the limbic brain. No, there, there's more to this. This is this is culture being built at a narrative level, and it is still part. It is still interacting with the neocortex. It is still interacting with all this stuff. So that that drove me crazy. But anyway, let's go ahead and get back to then. Uh, well, I guess there there are a couple other errors I should probably come through before we get out of this well, section. And, and, and real quick, like to to me, that stuff I I, I just kind of brushed through <laughs> it because yeah, it did. I mean, it didn't. I don't I don't think it helped the book at all. And maybe maybe it does for people who who need to see science behind behind everything. Um, but for but for me, I I just it, it kind of seemed like a a diversion in the sense of natural born heroes where. It, he, he went a direction where it's like, well, this story itself, you could have just told the story and it, it would have been amazing. And for start with why, uh, if you had just stuck on this original path and then maybe as you're saying, brought in some of these other things that it, it would have, it would have uh, made more sense, but I, uh, maybe, maybe people get a kick out of seeing that it connects to, to science. But as, as you point out, it's, it's not science. It's, it's not science. The, the other, the other thing that I thought a lot about, when I was reading this book is when I, when I worked at the apparel company, I would go to central America and I would go to these factories and that were making our product and I would walk around the factory and they were making everyone else's product as well. <laughs> and so you, you just go down the brand names. I mean, there would be top end brand names there and there would be, there would be low end and they're all being made at the same factory. And sure that there might be slight differences in, in yarn count and in quality and that sort of thing. But the point is, they're all being made at the same factory. So at that point, it becomes a matter of identification. What, what brand do I identify it with? If it's, if it's sports apparel, do I ide identify with what Under Armour says who they are or with Nike or do I, so it's, it's all about identity or, or with Russell or with, with any of the other sports apparel. I mean, if, it, if it's, there's going to be differences in quality, but they're not, they're not extensive and they're not, you know, 20, 30, $40 differences. <laughs> uh, so what you're paying for is that identity and for them to market that identity, you're paying for the you. brand. Yeah. And, and so, and, and the narrative that goes with the brand. Mm -hmm. what, and that's what, that's what cynic is really calling the why is that narrative, right? Yeah. Yep. Yeah. So in that, I think it, it connected with some of the other books we've read, but, uh, but yeah, it, it, to, to me, it was more about that marketing of, of the, of, of the identity. And he, he uses the, the term why, which on a side note is my daughter's favorite new word. <laughs> oh, that's a good word. Hopefully she never forgets it. That's I probably know. the best we, word for, uh, you know, I, I, if we can keep kids from never learn, never unlearning that one, that'd be good. Yeah. Uh, I'm, I'm enjoying the, uh, the rabbit holes it's taken us down. Oh yeah. It's, it's, it, that's, it, that can be more fun. I mean, a, a bunch of parents get frustrated with that, but you know, there's no reason not to embrace it. Mm -hmm. Um, so, uh, so a couple other, I, I, I couldn't help but nitpick some of this stuff because uh, I'm me and, uh, <laughs> that that's my, that's part of my why. <clears throat> so, um, anyway, you know, he says, uh, you know, he, he talks about, you know, how people do assumptions and all this right at the beginning of the chapter. And he says, this is important because our behavior is affected by our assumptions and our perceived truths. We make decisions based on what we think we know. It wasn't too long ago that the majority of people believed that the world was flat. This perceived truth impacted behavior. During this period, there was very little exploration. People feared that if they traveled too far, they might fall off the edge of the earth. So for the most part, they stayed put. It wasn't until that minor detail was revealed, the world is round, that behaviors changed on a massive scale. And uh, what might I be uh, <laughs> noting here, uh, <laughs> listeners? Hopefully uh, there are a few of you out there that recognize the problem. The, yep, that's right, listeners. This is the myth of the flat earth. It's not true that it wasn't too long ago that the majority of people believed that the world was flat. That is not the case. In fact, as far back as the ancient Greeks, people maintained that the world was spherical. The question during the Middle Ages was whether the, whether the earth was the center of the universe or whether the earth rotated around the sun. But both camps believed that the earth was spherical. From See, at I, least, I didn't know that. Yeah, from at least the fourth, 14th century on, 
there's pretty much no evidence that there, so there's no evidence that anyone of any educated class at all, sailors, anybody, that anyone believed in a flat earth. So here's a quote from Stephen Jay Gould. There never was a period of flat earth darkness among scholars, regardless of how the public at large may have conceptualized our planet both then and now. Greek knowledge of sphericity never faded, and all major medieval scholars accepted the earth's roundness as an established fact of cosmology, end quote. Well, I learned something new today. Yeah. What you see, actually, interestingly, is... Uh, this this flat earth historian uh or, or this flat, this myth of the flat earth i'm sorry um sorry i was re uh, reading a, a a little piece here uh this this myth of the flat earth really was introduced in between 1870 and 1920 it's a myth that was that was uh that was popularized then and basically has been has been thought you know Washington Irving and others you know helped popularize that, but basically there 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 is no one in uh, in the history of Western civilization here's historic so Jeffrey Burton Russell says the following with extraordinarily few exceptions no educated person in the history of Western civilization from the third century BC onward believed that the earth was flat. What about Shaq? <laughs> yeah. Well, or, or, uh, what's his name? Uh, Kyrie Irving. Yeah. Some of these guys. Yeah. But there, there is no, uh, no evidence of that. So I, I, I made the note here in this chapter. Well, it's ironic that this section, this whole section is itself built on a false idea and a false assumption and a perceived truth. His point is actually, he's, he's, he's living it by not apparently recognizing that nobody actually believed in that the world was flat. And that was not why there was less uh, travel and that was, there was not why people were not traversing the planet and so on. Everybody knew that. Everybody knew. Columbus did not sail the ocean blue in 1492 to prove that you that the earth was spherical. Everyone already knew that. Everyone had known that for roughly 17 centuries. So it's it, things like that. When that start when that shows up in the first in the first chapter, I'm already going, oh great. <laughs> then there's some few other things that I you know, and again I'm I'm ranting now, so there's a few other things. You know, and this is just really nitpicky on my part, but I can't resist where he says, you know, there are no more bogeys and bandits. The Air Force's nicknames for the good guys and the bad guys in her life in this in this example. Bogeys and bandits are both bad guys. Yeah. Bogeys are unidentified bad guys. Bandits are what they're called once they're once they're observed and identified. OK. Now, Top Gun, for that's, what it's worth. That's basically Top Gun, yeah. Well, Top Gun gets it wrong, too, because in, oh, really? in Top Gun, they call them bogeys the whole way through, yeah. whereas once they've actually been visually recognized, they should be called bandits. So, no, they're, once they're identified, they're, they're called uh, international relations. <laughs> yeah, yeah, conducting international relations. <laughs> yeah. So um, then I, I couldn't believe this statement. Being American is not better than being French. What? He said it. Yeah. Yep. He said it. That, that's a major error. Come on now. Major, major error. How, how can you even say that? Being American is not better than being French. Well, he's, he's, he's British. Yeah. British, well, American. British, Brit, the British should know full well yeah, that, yeah. That, that, that one is better than being French <laughs> anyway. Uh, but no, he does make the point, you know, he makes a culturally relativistic point that one culture is not better or worse than another. They're just different. I'm sorry to tell you, but some cultures are better than others. Cultures where they practice, say, female genital mutilation, that's not that's not no better or worse than another. No, that's worse than a culture where they don't. Right? Yeah. You know, the culture of North Korea is worse than American culture. It is. It's not just different. It's worse. Yeah. So there's some of those things that, that it, 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 you know, 
the, the other thing, and this was the thing, and, and you know, I, I, I didn't, I didn't buy his TiVo example either. You know, he talked about what TiVo should have done is really talked about their why. You know, TiVo failed not because they didn't have a why. They failed because of opposition within the industry first, and then because the providers then all co-opted their tech, which rendered it moot. The product was easily cloned, and they didn't. Basically, everybody else was able to do that and do so in a way that that better suited their their own interests that were already established. And then, you know, he says, well, you know, it's not the technology that failed. It was how companies tried to sell it for. And then he gives another example. Satellite radio has not displaced commercial radio in any meaningful way. And my response to that is, yeah, that's because the product, it's not the product uh, or it's the product that's failed. It's the product that's the problem, not the marketing or the lack of a why. Because he's saying, you know, satellite radio would just get together their why. The problem is when the why sucks, the problem's not going to be or the product's not going to be compelling. Mm hmm. You can have a why that's not effective. Satellite radio can identify their why, push their why, and no one buy it. Because there's already an alternative that may have a similar enough why that's that's free. People do sometimes choose on, on price. So that was another piece that, you know, that, that I didn't I, I didn't really appreciate. But the other the, the one thing that also just just really got me. Is it really true? That people cannot seriously, can people seriously not explain why they chose to marry their spouse? Like that was such BS to me. Like he says, and this is a quote, we have trouble, for example, explaining why we married the person we married. We struggle to put it into words, the real reasons why we love them. So we talk around it or rationalize it. She's funny. She's smart. We start. But there are lots of funny and smart people in the world, but we don't love them and we don't want to marry them. There's obviously more to falling in love than just personality and competence. And later on, he says, the limbic brain is responsible for all of our feelings, such as trust and loyalty. It is also responsible for all human behavior and our decision making, but it has no capacity for language. That's why we can't explain why we married this person or that person. Well, first of all, it, it's baffling to me that somebody couldn't explain why they married their spouse. <laughs> like, I've read that section to my wife and she went, that's what? <laughs> We could both sit down and go through the process of, okay, well, I had these, these things that I was looking for in a mate. This person checked off these various boxes. It was around the appropriate time for me to think about getting married. There were, uh, in terms of a uh, shared narrative and why, uh, and, and, you know, where we were hoping to go in life and our, uh, overall philosophy, we were very much aligned and, you know, we talked through a lot of that to really be sure of that, that we would, you know, line up well philosophically. And there are not very many people out there who would who would do that, uh, who, you know, share our, our particular uh, ideals and so on. And, you know, when when that box got checked and then other boxes got checked and we each found the other person sufficiently uh, physically attractive to actually want to be to be someone that we would sleep with uh, for the rest of our lives. Then we decided to get married. It was very simple. It was a straightforward decision. <laughs> and we both acknowledged that we could have, that we could have very easily have found someone else who ticks those boxes. And if someone else had, we'd be married to someone else. Yeah. Someone else might be out there, but we neither of us have found anyone else that would be as suitable a mate for either one of us. Because a lot of those other aspects that we were looking for and some of the things that have even been re revealed themselves since we're better, we're better fits for each other than we would have than, 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 than with anybody else that we've met. But it's just a matter of, you know, lots of things, particularly having to do with, you know, our own whys and who we are and what we believe and what, what we, you know, what our objectives in life are, those things lined up other things that we were other specific things that we were looking for lined up and they lined up better than other people that we'd been around. Although there were a few, there were a couple of people that I've been around that I could have potentially wound up with probably been a few people I've met since that I potentially could have, but you know, at that point I wasn't looking. So that's that. I, I don't understand like that whole, like I can't explain it. I, I just don't understand that at all. And he said, can, like, is it like, do you know people that really can't explain? Like, why are you married to this person? Like, I could give you like 20 minutes on why I married this person and go through every rational step that we took along the way to make that decision as we talked through, like, okay, well, should we do this? Maybe it's just a matter of people not having just actually thought about the why behind it. And it's... Or maybe people just don't think about their decisions, I guess. Yeah. 
I mean, I get, I mean, you got to keep in mind, Carrie, my, my wife and I, Carrie and I, uh, you know, we have a, we, we took uh, like six or eight months to buy a, a, a new comforter because we wanted to make sure we got the right one. <laughs> so, I mean, there is that. You guys are also like off the charts on rationality and <laughs> intelligence. So, so yeah, I mean, it's, I, but, but as he puts it, you know, the, uh, you know, this is biologically accurate because gut decisions happen in the part of the brain that controls our emotions, not language. But the problem is intuition is also a higher order function that, that occurs in the neocortex. It's not entirely emotional. It's not limbic. It, 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 it's, it's related to habituation and, and all of those things that we've talked about. But anyway, I've, I've, I've extended my rant long enough, especially <laughs> since lots of this book was really good. It's just this stuff drove me up a wall. <laughs> Every time he'd come back to, well, you know, you couldn't explain why you married the person you married. I'd be like, 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 heck, I couldn't. Yes, I could. Why not? <laughs> and I could explain why I potentially could have married somebody else. Yeah. If somebody else had had a lot of the same attributes, I would have been perfectly happy marrying them. Yeah. And she would have been perfectly happy marrying someone else. Like, this is the way it works. So. Well, I had one other part I wanted to hit and then we can go <laughs> towards the uh, conclusions. And, and this was just to, to connect it with some of the other books we've read. And it, especially with the effective executive and the 22 immutable laws. <laughs> so a few differences with the effective executive. And the first is that start with why says that a, that a leader must focus inside the company to define the why. So that's where ah, Simon Sinek says the, the leader should should direct the majority of their attention is inside the company. Peter Drucker in, in the effective executive said the opposite. He said the leader must focus outside the company on the consumer. Huh. So uh, one, one difference there. Another one is the effective executive says don't hire for your skill set. Or sorry, the effective executive says to hire for skill set and only that and, and to hire for what the person is best at. And if you make widgets hire the best widget maker you can hire, right? Yeah. Yeah. And start with why says to hire people who believe what you believe. So more about the belief and culture and in that as opposed to skill set. And then with the 22 immutable laws, there was a similarity in that value as a perception. And that was, that was one of the first things in 22 immutable laws. And we see that we saw that a lot in, in start with why as well, that, uh, the value value as a perception. And, and I think that gets into more of where you would have liked to seen the book go in terms of, of communicating why you're different, communicating why not, not just the why, but your identity as a company. And then that attracting people who, who have a similar identity or, or want to have that similar identity in in, in their, in who they are. Yeah. I think that's, I think that's right. I mean, I think the other, you know, more, uh, perhaps productive complaint that I have beyond some of the, uh, you know, skepticism or just irritation at some of the other stuff, uh, boils down to the question of, Oh, that, you know, this is inspiring. All right. Yes, it, it is. It is important to recognize that we need to have a why, but now how does one actually, obtain or find a good why and if you, you don't buy, and, you buy and, the follow-up book that's why that's and if how. you have to search to discover your why aren't you kind of already in trouble in that regard like and if your why is not based on anything rational is, is it going to be a good why i mean th that's one of those things you, like the the, the yeah. whys that i live by and, and this is one of those things, I suppose, that in some some cases, this is where religion or various philosophical positions and all that, they are based, in, in many cases, you know, embrace of, of various positions are based very much on rational factors, rational decisions. And then after that decision is made, then a person you know, is governed by, it doesn't have to think about it anymore and is governed by, you know, the other commitments that, that, that boil down to that. Sometimes, it, sometimes that decision isn't rationally made, but sometimes it is. But, you know, identifying your narrative and identifying your why and all of that, I would have liked to have seen more about that. And I guess the workbook, I guess maybe that, maybe that's, that'll, that'll help there. 
Yeah, I think so. I mean, I've, I've, I'm only a couple chapters into the to the workbook. I just got it yesterday. Uh, I mean, it's very very short book, um, and the majority of it is is getting you to to write things out. Uh, it, it does go a little deeper into that. I mean, one one chapter I've read is is basically just a recap of of start with why, and then and then they give some examples of of people they've met along the way and and where they're having trouble. But um, I, I, like, do you do you know your why, like, would you be able to clearly communicate a why that's gone through all parts of your life? Yeah. Yeah, there's, there's, there, you know, there's absolutely no difficulty doing that. I've got a number of whys that all plug together. You know, yeah. one, one is uh, act justly, love mercy, and walk humbly. Right? Yeah. Love God, love neighbor. You know, sir, uh, uh, love your neighbor as yourself. These are all, these are all why. why. Why do I do what I do? When someone asks me a question or when someone asks me to do something for them or when I'm taking up a job or whatever, what I'm really trying to do is live out, love your neighbor as yourself. Even when it comes yeah. to education, I want that person to be able to understand what will help them, what will help make their life better to understand. Like that mm -hmm. starts from this idea of love your neighbor as yourself. Like that to me, that, that is my why. Like the reason I exist is to be able to serve and help other people. Yeah. As much as possible. And, if, you know, hopefully I can get something out of that in the process. Hopefully I can, you know, survive and do well. But my ultimate aim, my ultimate mission is to love, love, love my neighbor as myself. If I can do that, and if I can go to my grave and I can say, you know what, I loved other people and I served other people, then I died. I will die a successful man. Hmm. And there's, that's a rational commitment. Yeah. I, I think where I'm getting tripped up because I, I, I was worried reading this book, like, well, I don't have a why. Like, if I look back with major things in my life, whether it's running or the business or relationships or whatever, like, do I have a common why? And does it, does it weave through all those? I think what you, what you just said, that made sense. I, th I think I was thinking it had to be some sort of a grand statement that, that tied all those things together. And it, and it gave reason to that. But even in, in thinking about it in terms of my business of, of why, why do I have the business? And what's, what's the why behind what I do? Like I, I, I'm having a hard time even communicating that. And I think the reason I'm having a hard time communicating it is, is part of what I saw in this book is that your why should go through all parts of your life. So I, I for my, for my business, even though it, I have a hard time communicating it, I, I know I'm trying to help others do what they're, they're best at. And yeah, and you're a facilitator. That's, yeah, all, that's I, always I, what your business has been with online, but then I'm thinking, okay, another big part of my life is running. So how does that relate to running? And does it need to be the same why there? I don't, I, and I don't think it does. I think you can have different whys for different parts of your life. I mean, let's put it this way. Um, <laughs> so if you're married, there are certain activities that you engage in when you're married mm -hmm. that uh, are not for the purpose of helping someone else uh do what they do better in a business sense. It's just not, not the way it works. Right. <laughs> um, hopefully not. Yeah, exactly. Well, I mean, I guess, it, 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 uh, well, that, that wouldn't really be marriage, I suppose, but, but, uh, but no, I mean, it, th this is the, uh, this is the, the, the thing that we have to recognize is that our why, so we can have an existential why, right. And, and I have a, a clear existential why, mm -hmm. you know, love your neighbor as yourself. This, and, you know, uh, I think that this is something that, that has been, uh, that that's basically the task of every human being. That's, that's why, uh, you know, we're, we're here more or less, uh, to love and serve one another. Great. Okay. That's an existential statement. Um, but you know, if I decide to go and, uh, uh, you know, do a workout or something, Am I really living that out entirely at that moment? Well, you could you can make the case. I mean, one one thing that's important, and you know, it's important to look after if you were going to love your neighbor as yourself, you actually have to love yourself, right? Yeah. Otherwise, you're not going to be really loving your, you know, you don't want to love your neighbor as yourself if you're if you're a, a self-masochist, right? Yeah. Um if you it, it, you know, that that that's a that's a factor there. And and so taking care of yourself 
making sure that you are fit to find a way that you enjoy to be fit, that sort of thing is actually a part of the deal. So running comes into that. Now, in terms of how then that larger existential uh, aspect of love, you know, lo loving your neighbor as yourself, if, if you're in my case, how does that actually get implemented into some uh, in, into a actual practice for, you know, business or whatever else? Well, you know, one person may be really good at, you know, various, uh, you know, maybe really good at, um, at rocket science. Well, the best thing that that person can do is apply that in ways that are going to better other people's lives. In your case, you know, you're a facilitator and, and you know, you, you work in marketing and you work in all sorts of other aspects of that related to, you know, internet presence and in some cases helping people set up their business to be uh, uh, more technologically uh, uh, sound and, you know, making sure that their, that their processes are better. You know, some of the, the executive coaching stuff that you've done and you've done really well. That stuff's helping those people in a way that is actually making them more effective. That's loving them in that way. It's applying that. But what you have is you have a sub why that's underneath the larger why. Mm -hmm. Now, what I think Cynic kind of misses in this is that it's important to have that overarching existential why from which you can get your sort of sub why for business and all these other things. Okay. But to say that my business why has to be my existential why is, I think, a mistake. Okay. That, yeah, that's where I was really They should go together. Up. I think we lose our authenticity if, if, my, if, my, uh, uh, if my existential why is, you know, love my neighbor as myself, and then my business why is, well, I'm a member of the, you know, the Nazi party, and my job is to put people into ovens, then something is out of balance. Something's out of whack. <laughs> Or, right. or even even just a more benign of, of of the example we said before of of the shareholders' wealth is our our ultimate concern running a company. No, it's not. It's 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 loving your neighbor as yourself. It's it's serving. Right. It's and, taking care of of your client. And and the, and that's everyone involved with the company. And that means customers. That means that means uh, employees. That means shareholders and all of that. And that means balancing all of that picture to make sure that it's the healthiest possible business for everyone, yeah. which trickles all the way down to environment, right? All the way down to, you know, making sure that, that we're environmentally responsible and we're not polluting mm -hmm. because doing so is ultimately not loving for those who are coming after us or who are outside the company. So, you know, that, that to me is a, is a, is a pretty darn good one. Uh, yeah. you know, someone fairly wise years ago introduced that one. Uh, and I, I think it's, I think it's, uh, stood the test of time in terms of, you know, love your neighbor. It's a pretty good place to freaking start. Yeah. And that why then can govern all sorts of other whys. And if we're constantly looking for opportunities, and this is where I think love your neighbor is a great entrepreneurial creed. If you're constantly looking for ways to improve people's lives, you're going to find stuff. And you're going to be very successful. And you're going to be really successful if you can find any way to operationalize it. Because, you know, the, suddenly you're going to be introducing products that are going to make people's lives better. Yeah. And people will pay for that. People will be grateful. That, that reciprocates, right? That, that comes right back. This, the circle is complete at that point. So to me, that's, that's where this all comes. And that's what I found a little bit lacking at times. I think it's important to, to start with the why, but the why matters. Well, and I think you, just this discussion really helped me understand it more. Um, and, and to to take that into our conclusion, I I met with one of my clients a few weeks ago, and one way this book helped me to think was even with the website development and design that I do in in helping clients communicate what they're about. And so with this particular client, I was saying, all right, here's how we should arrange your website. Your, your homepage should be your why. Your homepage should be why you do what you do. Your services page should be what you do. This is, this is the, the services that you provide. Your about page should be how you do that. And it, and it made sense to them. And, and so on services, we went through those. Uh, the, this particular client, the CEO, th this guy, he, he'll talk for two hours straight. So he has no problem talking. So we go through services. That's easy. We get to the about section. That's easy. We're filling that in. We get to why. This is the guy that started the company 20, 
years ago, and he could not tell me the why behind his company. This <laughs> man who I cannot get to to stop talking could not tell me his why. And it, it was really amazing. So I think I think Jason, with you, like you're very rational. You you're able to communicate things very well. I would say for the majority of people, it's very hard to to dig into that why. And maybe they know it at a deep level, but but to communicate it. Yes. And here I am sitting with a guy who who 20 years has been doing this business. He loves it. He loves it. Uh, he he loves his clients. He loves his employees. It's a big company. And he cannot tell me <laughs> why he started the company or why he, he keeps doing it. And I mean, I, I was I was asking him questions, trying to get it out. And, and, and it just went silent. So it. Sounds my, like a good one, consulting one my, opportunity for some for you and some others out there to help some of these people think about what their values are and then how that mm-hmm. impacts what their what their business does. Yeah, and, and that's one one of the other reasons I wanted to get the Find Your Why the workbook because I think that'll actually help me in in meetings and in being able to to present that this of, of you know here's the content we want, but it's really helping them understand their own business and why why they're doing it because if if I can't get that out of them, I can't put a good website together for them because it it has to be they have to know why they're doing what they're doing or or they have to know about their their business for me to be able to to then communicate that online. But my, one of my main takeaways of the, from this book is, is that it, it is a, it's a really hard thing to do. Uh, and, and I've had trouble defining my own why. I mean, just talking it through <laughs> on this podcast has actually helped me think of, think about it in a different way. But, um, I, I, I loved the book, but it, it, it's hard. And, and, and then also seeing that client not be able to, to describe their why and communicate it clearly, even though they, they're really good at talking, uh, that, it just kind of showed me that there, there's a there's a need for this out there, and and that's why it's one of my favorite books. Is because I think if you can have that clearly defined why, and maybe that's one of the reason why it didn't really stick with you because you you do have that. But I I would guess a lot of people don't. They don't have. They're just kind of going through the motions of every day. But if there is this why that that snakes through everything they do, uh, it it, it would just help clarify things. And then, especially for a business, it, it helps you know what you should and shouldn't be going after. And, and if a service you offer is not in line with that, get rid of it. It's not something that you're going to enjoy. And it's not connected to the why of, of who you are and, and what your company is about. Yeah. I, I mean, I think, I think that's well said. And, and I do think, again, I, I, I want to reinforce that even though I didn't enjoy this book as much, I do think there's a lot of positives to it. There's a lot of benefits to this book. Mm -hmm. Uh, and, and I think for a lot of people, it will be a, it'll be a good read. I think those who've heard this podcast hopefully will be, uh, thinking about the the importance, not just of finding your why, but finding a good one and, and, and understanding. And I, and I think this book, and we'll put it in the show notes, this book should be read in in tandem with a few others. Uh, I especially think that there's a, a chapter or two of, uh, of Christian Smith's, uh, work that would be, um, uh, that would be very helpful for, uh, for, for the, for the listeners. So, yeah, I mean, I, 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 like I said, I think it's, I think there's a lot of productive, a lot of fruitful stuff here, despite my rants and my, and my frustrations as you know, t- tends to be the case. Uh, it could have been better, but it's, it's got some really important points that can be helpful mm-hmm. for, I think a lot of people out there. Yeah. Well, that's, uh, that's going to do it for us today. A reminder, we're at booksoftitans.com, and then on Twitter and Instagram, we're at Books of Titans. We are all over the podcast world. I've been adding the podcast to different different locations recently. Uh, Stitcher, of course, we're on Apple, and we're also getting on some of the newer podcast directories, which are, are becoming a thing. I mean, there's so many podcasts out there now that, uh, that there's a lot of new directories coming out that, that try to help you connect with with the right podcast is something that you would listen to. So as always, you guys can help us out the most by, by sharing this with your friends, sharing it on, on social, and then, and then leaving a review that, that helps us get higher up in the, in the rankings and the, in the uh, directories as well. So next week we're going to be covering bird by bird by Ann Lamott. This was, uh, was another book that was, was very highly recommended by, by a number of people in, in tools of Titans. So on behalf of Jason Staples, I'm Eric Rostad, and this has been the Books of Titans podcast. Thanks for listening. Keep reading.
keep listening and keep improving. Keep it selectively real. I made this.